Um, I apologize for that ahead of time. I do use PowerPoint usually to rein myself in. My students tell me, you know, they like to get me rambling. So I'll try not to do that. Uh, primarily what I want to focus on today has more to do with the process of SIS integration, maybe some of the stumbling blocks that I ran into and that kind of thing. As an institution, we use Power Campus for our student information system, but I think that's kind of irrelevant because pretty much any student information system is going to give you some way to get at your data, whether that's an API or a trigger or, in our case, I get directly into the database. I happen to sit in the same office as our DBA and SIS admin, so that works out really well because we just talk to each other all the time uh, when we have questions. So I am a scuba diver. I just took this last weekend with, with my mom was taking the picture, so we had a good time in the, I think, 60-degree water. <laughs> was not terribly comfortable in that respect. But, so what is an SIS integration? Just starting from the ground up, and we'll go from there, okay? SIS integration just takes the data that you already have and puts it someplace where you want it to be. So we have all that data, we have the registration information, we have student names, we know what their usernames are, we know what classes they're enrolled in, we know all of that. We know the names of the classes, so why should we put it in more than once? Let's take that information out of the SIS and put it into our learning management system. So the next slide I know is a no-brainer. Okay, why do we want to do this? Well, it's easier. I didn't put that on there because that was kind of a obvious, right? But what we really get out of it, what our value proposition here is, it's going to save our IT people time. It's going to save our LMS admins time. But more importantly, it's going to make that data more accurate. We don't have to worry about typos. We don't have to worry about data corruption, hopefully, unless something happens to our internet connection. And we can f more frequently update the changes. Before I took over uh, as LMS admin, along with our instructional designer, who is also an LMS admin, uh, our previous LMS admin was getting dumps from our SIS admin and DBA periodically, and then manually updating them into our old LMS, which I won't mention the name, but wasn't Canvas at the time. And eventually, I was faculty at the time, and I moved into the IT role, starting out by setting up some integration with our old LMS and our Power Campus for our SIS. And I, we were really tied down in that respect, because our old LMS had a, a pretty limited set of SIS integration features. And I think it's important for me to talk about this, because Canvas is exactly the opposite. You know, you keep hearing open during this week, right? Canvas gives you the ability to do all kinds of wonderful things, whether that be through LTI, through a the API, and so on. So SIS integration is no exception. Uh, with my old system, what I had to do is talk to our hosting provider, and they would schedule time on their system where I would push up a, a file through SCP, and then they would grab that file and run it. Well, if I made a mistake, or my script made a mistake, or something bad happened, I would either have to contact them to have them do a manual run for me, or I would have to wait for the next period that they were expecting my file to come. With Canvas, you don't have that problem. Right? You can run those files whenever you want. So the frequency of updates can get better. And I'll talk about a little bit of what I'm doing here later on. So basically with Canvas, you have this, this basic process of what you need to do. And it's, it's divided into some pretty simple steps. And of course, each one of these little chevrons looks real simple, but it could take hours of programming depending on what you're trying to accomplish. So the first, obviously, is going to be to get that data out of your SIS. I need to have queries, or I need to know the API, or whatever format it is that your particular student information system is going to be expecting for you to dump that data out. In my case, it's generating SQL queries. So I touch the data directly and pull them out. Then you have to have some mechanism to format it into the file format that Canvas is expecting. And there's really good documentation on the Canvas API site that I link to later on that tells you exactly what to do. Uh, I've also included that information in this presentation. And I will put this presentation up um, at, the end of the, at the end of the session here. So we're going to grab that data out. We're going to format it appropriately. Then we've got to upload those files to Canvas. And then, of course, the last step, we don't just assume that it's finished and that nothing happened that was bad. We're going to check to make sure there were no errors, there were no omissions, and that kind of thing. So the first way, uh, how many of you are doing manual uploads right now? I'm just curious. OK, quite a few. Uh, so that's the first way we can do it, right? Some kind of manual integration. 
So we've got that format from our DBA, from our SIS admin, or maybe that's you, and you've got it, gotten it yourself. And then you have created this export file. Or maybe you're doing it manually. You're going in and manually creating every user, enrolling every student in every course. And I'm sure they're complaining about all the invitations they're getting <laughs> if you're doing it that way. So hopefully nobody's doing that except for exceptions. There's always going to be exceptions to your automated processes, right? Alternatively, which those of you that raised your hand, I assume, are doing this way, uh, you could export the CSV file and then upload it using your administrative GUI inside of Canvas. Right? There is one other way, though, uh, and this is the only joke that I've built into the presentation. So, uh, You could hire a team of monkeys to enter all the data for you. This is my son eating his favorite food. Uh, but you may end up with the works of Shakespeare, but you probably won't end up with the data that you wanted, right? according to the infinite monkeys theorem. So, uh, just, just to get into what you're probably here to learn about, really, we want to do an automated. We want to do this through the API so that we don't have to touch it unless we have to intervene for some manual reason, which is always going to happen. Uh, so the first thing you need to do is get the authentication set up. You can either use a pre-existing user. Uh, I probably would not recommend this. I like to create a user just for my SAS imports and then really restrict the permissions on that account to just what we need, which goes into the next step. I'm going to have to create a role inside of Canvas, an account level role, and then assign the appropriate SIS management permission to that role. And then, of course, assign the role to the user. Okay, so that, sh that second chevron encompasses all of that, creating the role, assigning the permission, and then putting the role applying the role to the user that you've created. Yep? Can you restrict the uh, API function that the user can access, like uh, just for the authentication only, or uh, just can you restrict like, the, the API function that the, the, the account can access? The question is, what kind of restrictions can you apply to those permissions? And it, it kind of depends. Uh, in this case, we're just worried about the SIS portion of it. And in that case, there are two SIS-related permissions. There's one for managing SIS data and one for reading SIS data. So you, generally, the account is never going to have somebody logged on to it, right? Any other of the API calls, you would have to give them the appropriate permission based on what you were trying to accomplish. So if you wanted them to read enrollments, they would have to have that ability in the course and so on. Uh, but it's not that granular. <laughs> uh, so we've got our account set up. Then we have to log on as that user at least once and generate an access token. And you do that under the settings for that account. Just go in there, create an access token for that user. Make sure you store it in a safe place. You don't want anybody getting a hold of it, but you can only generate it once, or you have to create another access token. So make sure you keep it in a safe place that you can get to later on. Then you're going to use that access token in, in whatever script it is that you're creating to import your SIS data. And then as far as that goes, once I've got my authentication setup created, the process is pretty much the same. I got to somehow export my data. I then have to format it into the appropriate file type. Then I have to upload the files. But this time, instead of going into the GUI, my script is going to make an API call. The specific call is SIS imports. And it's going to upload the file to Canvas. And then later on, I'm going to make another API call to see if that import succeeded. And that, that's pretty important, because if it didn't succeed, then you might have to rerun some of your changes but we'll get into that when we talk about some of that. So what are some of the options that I've got? Uh, within SIS imports portion of the API itself, you actually have two different options for doing your SIS imports. The first one is to do a full, term, a full batch, really, is what it's called, uh, for your whole term. And this is specific to a term, whatever term you've created in Canvas. Okay, so if, let's say I, I've... In my API, I flagged this as a full batch upload, which is one of the uh, attributes you have to set when you upload your API or upload through the API. You have to include the ID for the term for which you want this file or files to apply. If I were to upload a file that, let's say it was an enrollments file, and all the courses were in a different term, one of two things could happen all of my enrollments for the term that I intended to upload will disappear. <laughs> and none of the enrollments for the other term will happen because they're limited just to the term that you specified in the API when you made your API call. So that is important to remember. And that kind of filters down to the next step. 
If I upload an enroll enrollments file, every single enrollment, if I'm doing a full batch, needs to be in that file. If one is missing, it will be deleted, assuming that it was originally created through the SIS import system. If it was manually created, it won't be touched. Okay? You cannot change manual created, manually created courses, sections, or enrollments using the SIS import functionality. Uh, I, just to make sure, to me, it's a theory until I've tried it. So just to make sure, I ran a bunch of tests last week to make sure that what I thought was true was actually true, and it indeed is true. It will not change any of the enrollments, even if you specifically tell it to delete an enrollment, for example. If you manually created it, it's still going to be there. So that is a good thing to know. If you're going to embrace SIS imports, embrace them all the way and try to avoid manual intervention as much as you can because you cannot impact it with your SIS normal system. So this is, with the batch mode term ID, this is another attribute that you have to pass with the API. This is generally and by default going to be the canvas uh, ID, not the SIS ID you created for the term. And that's important to keep in mind. That's by default, but you can specify an SIS ID and just about any time you're required to put in a, an ID for a course or a term or whatever. And assuming we have time, I'll talk about it. Otherwise, I'll point you in the right direction. The other option, in, yeah. the other option that you've got is to just up upload updates. In this case, in the case of the full term updates, you're really not going to use deleted as a status a whole lot. It's almost always going to be active as a status. With scheduled updates, you're going to use both active, meaning I want this to be true, or deleted, meaning if I created this with SIS, ID, SIS imports at one time, go ahead and pull it out of there. This is more challenging though, right? Because now I have to have some way to track the changes that have occurred in my SIS system since the last time I updated uh, Canvas. Not only since the last time I updated Canvas, but the last time I successfully updated Canvas, right? Because I can't assume that something has happened unless I have confirmed that the, that the update in which it occurred was successful. Uh, the other option, one more option, but it's really kind of a combo move between those two. And this is what I'm doing now. I just finished my second version of my SIS integration for Canvas, and I'm now doing full batches and updates. So full batch I consider to be a reset. Maybe something messed up on my SIS or something mess up, messed up in my import system, and I need to reset the whole term back to what the SIS system actually is. I can do that. Or as soon as I activate the term, I want the whole thing to go up, right? I don't want updates to go up because there's going to be ads and removes. And I don't care about that. What does it look like now? And now let's start tracking. Yep. Does Power Canvas automatically track those changes? <laughs> I am so glad you asked. The question was, does Power Campus automatically track the changes? The answer is, not really. <laughs> but uh, assuming that I have time, I, I've got some gotchas in there, and I'll talk about that, definitely. Because that is one of, or come up and see me afterwards. That is one of the things that stalled me for about six months because I had other projects going on to get the second version done. And, you know, sometimes when you have something that's working and other things come up, it kind of gets put on the back burner. But I did finish it right before I launched it on Monday, my second version of integration. There is one other kind of method you could use with APIs. Uh, you could do direct changes to the API. So meaning in real time even, or scheduled I suppose, you could use the API without using SIS imports and say create this enrollment, delete this enrollment, create this course, create this section. I wouldn't touch that with a 10 foot pole, okay? First of all, whoops. First of all, you have a limit to the number of API calls that each user can make per hour, and that limit's 300. So you can see, if you're touching each individual object directly, that could exceed 300, <laughs> during, especially during enrollment periods, right? So uh, it is an option that's out there, but this is generally going to be another one of those things that's for exceptions. You know, maybe I want to create my term through my, my SIS integration, but I don't really want to upload an SIS file for it. I just want to touch the term API, tell it to create, and then grab my term ID off of that. So I, I put that up there just because it's one of the options. Which one of these ways is right for you? <laughs> well, that's kind of the $10 million question, right? It depends. You know, it depends on a lot of factors. How much time do you have to devote to this? Do you have people with the skill in your organization 
to pull something like this off? Are you willing to learn something new? What programming languages do you know? In reality, does it really matter what programming language you use to pull this off? Not at all. I use PHP, but that's just because that's what I know, and I know that I can use it on a lot of different kinds of systems. But if you like Java or you like C Sharp or whatever, you could do it uh, any way you want. That's the beauty of, of this API. Or, of course, Ruby on Rails, that would work too. How much data are you going to handle? If you're talking about a ton of data, so let's say our FTE is very small, we're less than 2,000. But let's say you had a 50,000 FTE in your organization. Chances are you're not going to want to push up a full batch update every hour because you're probably stepping on the last one, right? There's a, there's a chance of that anyway. Because with the 50,000 FTE, how many enrollments do you have? You know, probably a couple hundred thousand enrollments. And uh, that could get ugly really quickly. And that goes back to the original slide where I had the chevrons pointing at each other. Always check the status of your last import before you start your next import for a given term, okay? So you're not walking on on your up imports. Eventually, I imagine Instructure will probably give you a call if you have like 15 imports running at the same time. They might not like that very much. And quite frankly, is it very efficient for you? Absolutely not. Uh, how frequently do you want to update? You know, if you're uploading your CSV files manually right now, you probably have an update frequency of what, maybe a couple times a day, maybe once a day, and then once the term really gets going, maybe a couple times a week. But you can up that, up that and reduce your workload with automated SIS integration. So you could be doing it a couple times a day with no sweat. Uh, my new version sends up updates every 15 minutes. But it's doing deltas. It's doing changes only after that first initial push. And it makes sure it's not walking over itself before it starts its next, its next update. Uh, this last one is kind of interesting. And this is something that that you really need to think about first. And that's what kind of and how much access do you have to your SIS data. With Power Campus, I was lucky. The DBA trusts me. Uh, I had already been doing automation for user account creation. So they didn't have any problems giving me certain access directly to the tables. But in your organization, you might have a lot more stringent requirements, and you might not be able to pull something like that off. So you'll have to figure out within your organization not only what kind does the SIS give you, but what kind is your MIS uh, department willing to give you to your own data. And that, that might be your biggest challenge of the whole project, honestly. So a few considerations. And I know it's kind of silly, but seriously, you need to get to know your DBA or MIS, MIS admin. In my case, it's the same person, uh, and she's great. Uh, just holler over the little wall that we have separating us, and, and we can talk about different things. But now getting to your question, <laughs> what kind of data does your SIS system have that you can access? Last fall, uh, you know, I'd just come back from InstructureCon last year. I was super excited to get started on this integration. I had previously done an integration, as I mentioned, with our old LMS. And I kind of rolled that integration and changed it a little bit to work with Canvas. And that's what I was running for my pilot it's with the anticipation of getting my next version of the system up and running by the spring. Well, I, I don't usually plan. I, I know it's bad to say, but I don't usually spend a lot of time planning my code. I do it in my head, and I have a notebook. And I sketch things, and I write ideas, and then I start working. And what I find is that that kind of iterative design approach works for me. Because uh, I'm just, that's just the way I work best, I guess. Uh, for some people, might not work that well for you. But this time I decided, yeah, I'm going to do it right. I'm going to write a bunch of documentation. And I'm going to have data dictionaries for my personal database set that I was going to use. And I spent hours upon hours designing this. And I made bad, a bad assumption at the beginning. And that bad assumption directly addresses what your question was. <laughs> uh, within Power Campus, the table that I use to pull enrollments is the academic transcript. Okay. That holds all the ads, the withdrawals, and the drops that are in there for a particular student. And there was a field called revision time and revision date. Uh, I'm not sure why they store it in two different fields when they're both date times, but that's the way that it was. So I thought, oh, great, I can just use that to pull my deltas to figure out what changed since the last time. 
Unfortunately, what I forgot to really consider was there might be other things that are getting changed in that particular record that would alter the revision date and time. And in this case, every single time somebody was present for a class, it would update that academic transcript record uh, to show the last time they had attended the class. So that meant every time they attended a class, the revision date time changed, which would, may, would it have still worked? Absolutely. But I would have had a significant amount of redundancy. And that was something I was trying to avoid. You're always going to end up with a little bit because you want some overlap, right? So that you don't miss anything. But my overlap now is uh, two seconds rather than every week the same person gets added to the class. So that, that set me back. And I had to uh, really reconsider how I was going to pull off this project now. And I had considered uh, doing a shadow database where I kind of kept track of everything that was going. Well, then I got pulled into a, a migration project for our email system. And by pulled in, I mean I started it and then had to do it myself. Uh, <laughs> so we migrated off into the cloud for our email. And finally, it came back around. I had some time to do this. And I was just kind of searching around. Uh, you know, how, how you do when you're, you're trying to come up with the idea of an answer to a problem and you're not really sure what the answer is. And I came across triggers, Microsoft SQL triggers. I'm not a DBA. I, I can do a little bit, and I know SQL, obviously. But uh, as far as the back end of Microsoft SQL Server, it, it's more or less a mystery to me. But triggers, so I yelled over the wall, hey, Joanna, that's our DBA's name, what what about triggers? And she's like, oh, I use those for, for certain things. In fact, she uses a trigger for the very thing that made me run into, <laughs> run into the wall. Uh, so we set up separate tables within our Power Campus database with triggers associated with the key areas. So that academic transcript table, anytime it changes a status for a student, we'll add another record to my uh, change log table that I can then go back through and look. So the, the moral of that story is, if you can't find a solution in your current feature set, make one, right? And that's kind of what you're doing with your SIS import anyway. The other challenge that I ran into that I was not expecting was when somebody is removed as a teacher of a course, their record is deleted from that table. It's not a status that's changed. So uh, again, another change table, and I now have my tracking mechanism. Uh, and the triggers are not terribly complicated. If you're interested in the triggers that we're using, I'm more than happy to share them if you're using Power Campus. Uh, they haven't been fully tested because I just started this new version. So if you run into some bugs, you know, we can fix them. I'll, I'll have to fix them anyway, or Joanna will have to fix them. So <laughs> somebody's going to have to fix them. Uh, so that's the biggest, the biggest kind of challenge that I ran into. The other is to define your scope up front. There's always exceptions to anything that you want to pull off, right? So think about what those exceptions are going to be and see if it makes sense to roll them into your project up front. Uh, one of the things that I do as an exception is to join courses together so that I have multiple, by default, a section creates a course. But some instructors want, to, let's say they're teaching three sections of the same course, they want all those sections to be into the, in the same course. No problem. I have a table that takes care of that and it joins the sections together. It's really easy to do. That is not a problem at all. Uh, and the instructors like it. What do you want to control? What do you want to create? Well, more than likely, you want to create all that stuff. So we're running out of time. I'm not going to say each one of those things. Uh, what are the timings? This was another one. In our institution, they didn't want me doing student enrollments until after the last date of pay drops occurred. So I have to create the courses and the sections and the faculty enrollments up front. And then later on, I turn on the student enrollments. But are there going to be exceptions? Absolutely. So you have to come up with a way that you can do your enrollments. And always remember, you want to do them through your SIS import. Because if you do them manually, then you're not going to be able to uh, edit them or modify them later on with your SIS import system. So I have a system in place that will uh, allow me to set early timings for certain courses if necessary. Just some things to think about. Uh, so there's my list of little exceptions that I came across and some of the gotchas. I already talked about most of these things, but as I said, I'm going to put this PowerPoint up so that you can kind of look along through here. That second to last there and the, and the last go together, you're going to run into roadblocks. It's going to take longer than you think it's going to take, but in the end, it's going to be worth it, so don't give up. You know, work around the problems that you come up with. Work with the people at your institution to try to get 
creative solutions to some kind of annoying little problems that you're probably going to run into no matter what you do. The next two slides that I, I prepared because I asked Ben if he would ask what people were having problems with. And these were some of the things that came up. So I thought I'd put, a little, put together a little bit of a, a, a cheat sheet, if you will, for some of the things that are interesting. So uh, most of the stuff I've already talked about, but uh, if you download this presentation, it's there. You can print it out, hang it on your wall, you know, put a little picture of me on there. I don't know. Whatever you want to do. Uh, but the next one is, is more important for us to talk about, and that's the CSV format. The documentation is really good that's up there but there are a few little key things. And the most important thing, because I'm almost out of time, that I want to say is don't upload CSVs by themselves because then you have to think about the order in which you upload the CSV. So for example, you can't create a section for a course if you have not yet created the course. Okay? But if I have the course CSV file and the section CSV file and I zip them together and upload that file, it takes care of it for me. So you don't have to be concerned about that. So I always zip my files, even if there's only one. I didn't want to come up with a, a separate in, uh, instance. Uh, one of the other gotchas you might run into is for users that you have not yet created in your authentication system and might not have usernames in your system yet. Uh, I ran into that while I was doing testing for my new system and had to, it's, you know, it's easy to work around. If it's null, don't create it. Just pull their enrollments out and flag them that they haven't been done yet or haven't been completed yet. The other thing that, that was pointed out with the CSVs that were kind of interesting, the file names are irrelevant. It makes no difference what you name the file, but the headers are very relevant. It uses those, the headers at the ver on the first line, and they have to be on the first line of the CSV file to determine what kind of file it is. So if you get those headers wrong, it's not going to know what to do with it, and you're going to end up generating an error. Um, I automate everything I can, as Ben already mentioned, but here's what we're doing. Uh, right now, I'm doing every 15 minutes starting in the fall, my updates occur. Before that, it was every, every two hours. This is more for when I upload the presentation for you. But I can't say enough of, about Brian Whitmer's Canvas Dev and Friends course that he just put up a couple months ago. Get on that. It's not going to take you a couple hours to do. It's going to take you a couple days. So just be expecting that and work on it as you have time. But it is a great primer for how to use the LTI, how to do API. The best advice I got from Brian from that course was don't try to do OAuth yourself. Find a library to do it for you. Okay? Uh, that's really more relevant to LTI. And here's my contact information. If anybody wants to get a hold of me later, feel free. Yep. Uh, when, you, when you run the, uh, like a, like, uh, the, uh, the job, like you have a comprehensive one and you have the delta that uh, you run, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I have a separate table within my configuration database that I'm just running on my SQL okay. that I keep all the information about each run. Okay. So before the next run starts, it looks in my term table to see what the ID for the previous run was, okay. checks the ID, and then downloads and stores all the information. That makes sense now. Yeah. It's definitely important to do that. Right. Uh, any other questions? So the question was, what if I have a redundant add it, or a redundant delete, right? It could be either way. Uh, if I have a redundant active st status, it doesn't matter. It's not going to air out. It's just going to say I did it <laughs> because it's already done. And that's why I have that two-second overlap. I know I'm going to have some redundancy, but it should be pretty, pretty minor. Uh, I just don't want to miss anything. That's the real key, right? That's good. I did not realize that. When I ran my tests, I only tried it once. I didn't try to delete the student a second time. 
So what, what he had said was uh, if you had an ad that was manually created, the first time you run an ad for the student to be added to the course through SIS, it changes the management to an SIS style. And then theoretically, you should be able to delete it. Right, and I, I tested that. And, it, and it, it worked? Works, which is in fact what we wanted. Yeah, that's excellent. That's good to know. So I'm glad you, I'm glad you said that. Yeah. Any other questions? Yep. Mm-hmm. At least cross list across terms. Oh. Yeah. Oh, and then they will because the, the enrollment disappeared or the course creation disappeared or whatever. The, his comment was that if you do cross listings that span terms, you should try to avoid full batches because it will remove things kind of unexpectedly. No, it's not. It's just in the terms. Uh, and they say that they'll, they track it, but and if, if you start abusing it, then they'll kind of call you. <laughs> That's what the terms say. On my uh, helpful information, there's a link to the terms in here. So actually, I think it's in the notes section. But I think we're out of time. So thank you very much for attending. If you have questions, feel free to come up.